Before we get into the, the actual causes of homosexual confusion, um, I know that there's some foundational things that you felt really strongly about that we kind of needed to talk about. Um, and so what, what are some of those foundational things, David, that we need to share this morning before we get into even the causes of this issue? Well, just briefly, if, if you ask the average person on the street, and we did this in two cities, uh, are people born gay? The answer would almost 100% be yes. Uh, when in fact, that's absolutely untrue. Every scientific study that has ever been done on genetic or other biological origins of homosexuality have failed to show that, it is de that homosexuality is determined by genes or by any other form of biology. So we're being misled by the media again on that one big time. Do they do that? <laughs> David, I, I'm sitting here even remembering right now, nearly 25 years ago, I remember I was in Paul, Palm Springs with my wife, Sarah, and um, there was a, a headline on USA Today, and, it, and I don't remember it exactly, but the, but the headline basically said that they had found proof that people were going to be born gay. That was the headline. And then when I actually read the article, it said no such thing. And it was that they were trying to find it. But even in the presentation of it, it, it was not being truthful. Right. And even at that time, I remember that time, it was a big news story in Newsweek magazine. Yeah. And in Newsweek magazine, they, they were honest and quoted like some, the world's top geneticist from Oxford University as saying, it's ridiculous. That's not how genetics work. So I could go into that in detail, but you can read the scientific studies and the peer reviews. Even the gay researchers, almost all of whom were gay, have admitted that they have proven nothing in any of their studies in terms of the origin of homosexual confusion. Um, what it actually takes is a unique mix of factors, a multiplicity of elements converging together in a unique person with a unique personality, with a unique all kinds of things going on to actually precipitate a homosexual attraction in someone. So as I begin to list the things that are some of the more common causal factors or contributing factors, don't for a second think that if your son or daughter has one of these, that they're therefore destined to be gay. That's, that's not true at all. It takes a real convergence of many factors in someone. Uh, the first thing is the timing. Uh, say you were sexually abused, which is a, a major factor. Um, were you sexually abused as a five-year-old? That's going to impact you far more deeply because your formation is happening at a critical stage then than if the same molestation happened when you were 15, for example. Not that it wouldn't damage you at 15, but it will damage you far more at five. So the timing of the event, the family dynamics. Were, when you were molested, were, did you have a family you could confide in uh, and be believed? Um, or did you have a family that you could confide in that, that you are feeling sexually attracted to uh, the same sex and be believed? Or did you have a family who would reject you and uh, criticize you and ridicule you? Big important difference. Do you have a safe environment to share your deep heart with? Another uh, big critical factor is your emotional health when things start going wrong, when the trials and traumas uh, start happening. Are you emotionally healthy when, when that occurs? Or are you an emotional basket case in a certain sense? Have you already been traumatized, maybe abused or beaten up or something? And so you're emotionally fragile. And so another thing coming along can you, affect you and send you in the wrong direction much more easily. Your spiritual health. Do you know God? Do you have a loving, deep relationship with him so that when you are hurt, you can turn to him and hear his voice comforting you and affirming you? Mm. Or do you not know, know God at all and you have nowhere to turn to? That can, that can affect the outcome of these things. Your personality and your temperament can affect. Uh, I don't know if you noticed it, but the majority of homosexuals have a higher than normal sensitivity level in their temperaments. I certainly have my entire life. Much higher level sensitivity. Um, so when I was hurt, it impacted me far more deeply than my other three brothers who did not develop homosexual confusion. What was the difference? One of the differences was my temperament. I took things more deeply and I mistook things. 
hmm. more grossly. When you say mystic, David, you mean you took things that weren't even reality. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I misperceived what was happening to me and made judgments that were completely wrong. Hmm. Um, state of neediness, state of dependency. Are you an unaffirmed child and you're very needy? Well, if somebody comes along and, and tells you you're wonderful and you're beautiful and you're manly or you're womanly or whatever sex you are, uh, and nobody's ever told you that before, you're far more vulnerable to them leading you into deeper and darker things than if you're not needy and dependent or naive. The events themselves that happened to you, were you sexually touched inappropriately or were you brutally raped? The difference uh, is gonna make a difference in how that event impacts your life and the formation of your sexual identity. The number of times it happened, did it happen just once or did it go on throughout your childhood? That also will be a major factor in whether uh, these outcomes occur. Outside influences. Okay, so you didn't have a dad or a dad who affirmed you, but you had a scoutmaster, you had a coach, you had a teacher, you had a youth pastor who did affirm you. Okay, you can get your male bonding in many ways. It doesn't have to be your actual real dad. So the outside influences can have a great effect on the outcome of what happens to you and, and how you take things. Which I think that, that's so important, David. You know, because as, as the men in the body of Christ, you know, we're, we're surrounded by, you know, uh, single parent children and, and, and young boys who are being raised faithfully and as best as they possibly can by loving mothers. And how important for us to have that vision and to understand how important it is for the men of the body of Christ to take those boys in, in a sense, and affirm them and yes. bless them in, in their particular manliness and in their gender that God created them with. Really, really important. You, you can't imagine how important that can be for a young boy. Mm. Uh, and just one of the other factors, the spiritual health. Um, God the Father is there also. I mean, if you have a deep and intimate relationship with God, you can go to the Father and be fathered, even if you have no one else. And this is how I was healed, really, was developing an intimate relationship with God the Father and having Him impart to me the missing pieces of my life and heal the broken things in my life. Yeah, so David, to be clear, we're not saying that, that if these things are present, that this person is absolutely destined to live a homosexual life. What we are saying is these are kind of um, contributing factors that any combination of them could contribute to that. Yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. So we're talking about um, common causes now, um, not just foundational things, but the real, we're gonna unpack it a little deeper, the, the common causes of homosexual confusion. Um, the first one being confused sexual identity brought on by a lack of emotional bonding with same-sex parent. Yeah. So go ahead and unpack that for us. Well, um, as I mentioned last week, there's a, there's a window for boys that is important. Uh, everyone bonds with mom when they're born. There's a chemical oxytocin that creates a natural bonding. Um, but with boys, they have to uh, transfer their bond with mother to father in that two to five year old window. There's a, there's a developmental window that's been proven repeatedly in studies where the boy has to transition to uh, feeling like he's dad or he wants to be like dad. Um, now, of course, if dad is, is unattractive, if he's beating up mom, if he's absent and he's not feeding in those affirmations, the boy is going to miss out on, on some critical input in the development of his sexual identity, his gender identity. Now, this can be made up for through puberty. So, say a, a male figure comes in at the age of nine, uh, who is healthy and affirming and does the things that the boy should have gotten earlier, that can make up for that. So it's not like either two to five or you're, or you're out, you know, mm -hmm. kind of situation. Mm -hmm. uh, there's all kinds of ways that God can send people in to make up for those deficits, including God the Father. If the boy develops a strong intimacy with God the Father, the father can supernaturally impart the fathering to the boy that he's missing otherwise. Yeah. And this is how I was healed after I came to the Lord. Even though I was no longer that young, the father 
directly imparted the missing pieces into my soul mm -hmm. as I got into intimate relationship with him. It's beautiful. We're going to talk more about that in a while, I know, but... It's... And again, the perception is everything. I mean, your father may actually love you, but he just doesn't know how to communicate it to you. But if you don't think he loves you, that's your reality, and mm -hmm. you're going to react according to what you believe. And so it's not necessarily the parent's fault even when these things go wrong. Yeah. Um, that's a really important part, and, and I mentioned it last week, you know, Adam and Eve had the best father in the world and they found their way to sin. And, and I know that there's, uh, there's parents that potentially could deal with a lot of guilt and shame because, oh my gosh, did I not love right or enough or, and um, listen, I, I don't know the answer for your individual thing, but I do know this, guilt and shame isn't the answer. Uh, forgiveness and redemption and healing and and if it was an issue in your family then like getting that fixed would be an important thing uh, for your future and obviously through the work of God's grace all of that stuff is fixable mm -hmm. it's redeemable mm -hmm. it's it's what God specializes in doing is taking broken people from broken circumstances and creating a new creation out of them and, and given them a fresh start and a new life. And so that's what God does. We can't ever lose, um, 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 lose, uh, huh, track of that. It was a difficult word like track uh, <laughs> that I was trying to get from my vast vocabulary. <laughs> we can't ever lose track of that, that it is God's desire and not just his desire, but God has the power to do this very thing through his love and grace. And so we can never forget that. Right. We always have to proclaim that. David, I wanna go through a list of, of contributing factors here. We've, we've kind of talked about you know, cause, but some other contributing factors. I know the peer factor is, is radically important. Could you unpack that for us a little bit? The peer factor is critical. If, you get, if you're a young boy, for example, and you get ridiculed by your peers, and they start calling you queer and fat and gay, it's not necessarily because they see any of that in you. That's just what kids do to kids to put them down mm -hmm. and to f make themselves feel better than somebody else. They don't necessarily see anything in you that would point to that. But if you're a sensitive kid who's unaffirmed, you're going to believe that. You're going to let that person name you. Mm -hmm. And you're going to take on that identity and begin to believe it over time if that behavior, particularly if they're beating you up at the same time and so you're being bullied at the same time. And so, that can be a huge factor in, in the development of homosexual confusion in some children, but not in most. Keep that in mind, not in most, in some. Uh, and what happens, and this is what happened with me, I didn't get called queer and fat a lot, but I was bullied. In fact, I didn't get called queer and fat ever, uh, now that I remember it. But I was bullied, and I was rejected, and I felt disconnected from my gender group. And so what I did was, I started studying them, the guys who were really successful at being popular. And I studied the way they combed their hair and the way they dressed and the way they walked and the things they said. And I tried to determine what they did that was successful so that I could start doing the same thing and therefore become successful mm -hmm. as, as a man, as a male. Uh, problem with that was the things I fixed on as the, the, go, the you know, the, the things that would make me okay, some of those things I would never be able to achieve. For example, one of them was the guys who were tall. Another one was the guys who were handsome. Another one was the guys who were athletic. Well, I, was, I struck out all three of those <laughs> when I was a kid. So this, this studying of what made them popular and successful that I was doing, once I realized I could never have those, that turned into envy and I began envying them. And this is when it went from a, a non-sinful situation. You're, it's not a sin to be attracted to the same sex. There is no sin in that. It is when you begin to cooperate with, uh, with the process, particularly when you start acting out sexually. But the early stages of the cooperation are when you begin to envy, and then that turns into idolatry. Of course, the Bible's very clear in Ephesians 5.5 5, that sexual immorality is one of the forms of idolatry. So when you're beginning to idolize peers of the same sex or 
media figures or whoever, then you're into idolatry. And so you're entering, you're, you're allowing Satan to come in and create some significant ground in you. So peer pressure is one thing. Um, and then societal pressure. Yeah. There, here's a whole nother thing. So it's not just kind of your immediate peers who are pressuring or can pressure, but then there's society as a whole that are pre pressuring and pushing in on you. Yeah. So when the President of the United States says you're gay and that's beautiful and God made you way, that way and it's holy, he's an authority figure. So you believe him. Uh, when your school teachers tell you that, when your librarian tells you that, when your school counselor tells you that, when all of the societal figures and structures are beginning to tell you to give into that, that that's who you are, that you were born that way, and just give into it, or else you're being unnatural. Hmm. Um, Dishonest to your true self. Exactly. Dishonest yeah. to your true self. As a kid, you're, you're going to yield to those voices eventually if you keep listening to them. And so society can, can be a, a significant factor in people who are vulnerable to such voices. The thing that, that seems to keep coming up over and over again, and we'll see it as we even continue on, it's, it's this issue of identity. Wow. It's letting people name you things mm -hmm. that God never does. Right. And, and the importance of, of saying, you know what, I am who God says I am, not who my brokenness or, um, or my struggles or society says that I am. You, you've really got to be careful what you own as your identity because yes. it defines who you are. It actually changes your brain structures and the way you think. Your brain will actually change structure according to what you believe and how you behave. Well, David, we've um, talked about some, some serious things in the midst of all this, and um, could you talk to us about the contributing factor of pornography? Well, pornography can be a big factor. Uh, again, it depends on other factors fitting in like a puzzle. But particularly if you're exposed to homosexual pornography as, as a young boy or girl, and uh, you didn't know people did that to begin with, or look like that to begin with. And so it's a big shock anyway to your system, the whole sex, being sexualized. And so there's a great deal of chemical imprinting going on in your brain during such moments that are quite formative. And if it's homosexual pornography that you're being shown, you're wondering, why am I being shown this? Does that person think I'm gay? Uh, and then you look at the pictures, and if there's any arousal whatsoever, then you start saying to yourself, well, I must be gay, or it wouldn't be aroused. And all these lies start filtering in from the evil one, starts planting in all these self-doubts uh, about the meaning of what's happening to you. Even uh, heterosexual pornography can contribute in a very sensitive temperament to homosexual confusion. Because as you're looking at those great looking people doing those amazing things in that heterosexual pornography, you might be saying to yourself, I can never do that. I would never look like that. I would never get a girl like that. And so it can push you deeper into your homosexual confusion, even though you're looking at heterosexual pornography. So pornography can be a, a significant factor. Yeah, I, I wanna um, just pause here for a second um, and, and talk to you parents with young kids, okay? Um, I wanna tell you a story that I, I know to be true of a very, very committed Christian family uh, very conservative in what they allowed their kids to participate in, uh, the TV shows that they watched, like really were serious about protecting the innocence of their child. Um, that child grew up and everything, you know, w was good, looked good on all counts. And then that family found pornography on their home computer. And it came out that um, one of the children in the family owned up to it. And then when the parents said, how did you ever even like, <laughs> and the child said, as a, as a young teenager, years ago, our neighbor, who was a friend, another young child, because that child's father had showed that child pornography, then that child showed it 
to, the, to this child who was from the conservative Christian family. So what am I saying? I'm saying, parents, you can't be too careful. You can do everything right in your own house and it can be undone in a moment because someone who lives a few houses down is, is so sexually broken as an adult that he is showing pornography to his own child and then that child shows it to maybe your child. You don't ever get that back. That, that is innocence gone. The, those, those are imprints in, in, in the mind. Now, whether they have power over you or not in the future is one thing, but parents, please be careful. Amen, somebody? Amen. Yeah. I don't mean to breed fear in any of this, but unfortunately, we live in perilous times, and these are real issues that we have to deal with. Um, homosexual play as, yeah. as a child, playing out the role, acting out the role as a homosexual. Um, there's a lot of kids who will do a, a homosexual act, you know, three, four, five through 10 years old once and never go back and do it again. It's when you see it beginning to be repeated over and over and over again that you want to really take note because it is a formative act. When you have sexual pleasure, the brain chemistry, once again, kicks in and rewires the brain and creates new neural pathways. And so somebody who keeps reinforcing the sexual pleasure they're having again and again in any way, whether it's homosexual or, or any other way, is going to begin to program themselves in that direction, even though they otherwise might, might not even go in that direction. So that can be, can be a significant factor. It doesn't necessarily have to be a factor. Now this issue of dysfunctional parenting, where maybe there isn't sexual or physical abuse happening, right. but there, there are parental dysfunctions that are happening. Speak yeah. to that. Yeah, I've met a lot of uh, homosexuals who, whose parents wanted the other sex when they were born. The boy was born and they wanted a girl. And they treated him like a girl. And that little boy grew up knowing that he was going to get love and affirmation only if he acted like a girl. And so he was misled by the desires, the selfish desires of the parents and how they either overtly or sometimes um, unconsciously communicated their dislike for what they got and their desire for the other. Uh, sometimes that can be very overt, whereas where you dress up the boy as a girl or dress up the girl as a boy. Um, but um, the child picks up on those cues. And so it's very important, even if you did want the opposite sex, never to communicate that in any way to your child because it does affect them. They do pick up the signals. Um, also, you might have a situation where maybe the mom's getting abused by men. Maybe all her life she was abused by men. And she doesn't realize it, but she's developed a real fear and hatred of men. And maybe she doesn't mean to, but maybe she communicates that to her son. You know? She affirms him when, she does, when he doesn't act masculine and when he does act feminine. Hmm. And so these kinds of scenarios where parents are broken in some way can impact children in quite unexpected ways. We've um, made mention of the spiritual component to this, and this really is a spiritual issue that we're talking about. I, I know it's, it's emotional brokenness that leads to it, but there's a huge spiritual component involved in this. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I wanna be clear about um, this next phrase that we're gonna use, which is demonic influences. Mm -hmm. We're clearly not saying that someone with same-sex attraction or, or uh, practicing homosexuality is somehow demon-possessed. And, you know, I, I would never want to paint that wide brushstroke with that. But understanding the spiritual component to this, speak to this issue of, of demonic influences as being a contributing factor. Well, it really starts with the sins of the fathers being passed down from generation to generation. So if you have sexually broken parents... Uh, that, that predilection can get passed down to the children. I don't know how that happens, it, perhaps in the DNA, but definitely it happens in the spirit, 
where the vulnerabilities of the father gets passed down to the, to the child unless the parents become spiritually uh, born again and break the curse. It says clearly in Ezekiel 18 that that curse can be broken yeah. by any generation that decides not to go along yeah. with that particular behavior. So taking the time to break any family curses that you may have brought in from your prior dysfunctional behaviors so that your children are not affected. But then there's also the factor of just sins that the child chooses to commit. I made vows against my father. I hated him. I judged him. And so I was creating ground for the enemy to come in and bring in more confusion because of my sinful responses to the hurt I felt. Um, so so by, by our own willful choices, we give ground to Satan in our lives. And the more willful our sin is, the more defiant it is, the more knowing we were that it was wrong when we did it, the more ground, everything else being equal, Satan gains in that particular moment. And that's not true just with homosexuality. That's true with all sin. Yep. The more we close our fist and shake our fist at God and His ways and say, you know, I'm going to do this thing and I don't care what you think about it, you know, your heart just gets harder and harder and harder to the things of God. The enemy has a heyday with all that. Yeah. Very, very sobering things. And so when you finally come to Christ and actually lose your life to gain it, uh, that's one of the things you'll need to work through is, is dealing with this, the strongholds that have come in as, as a result of your various choices. Yeah. I, I just want to say how important this is for us to recognize this. This isn't just a natural thing. This has a very real spiritual component to it that has to be dealt with spiritually. Now, here's the good news. The good news is Jesus is the ultimate spiritual authority. He's come to give us life and life more abundantly. He's come to redeem us and set us free, and he has all power on heaven and earth to do that very thing. So as much as we talk about these contributing factors and that it is spiritual and, you know, the devil gets in there and messes with people's thoughts and he lies to them, listen, that's all true and we need to acknowledge that, but what we also need to acknowledge is the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ to eradicate and make all, yes. all things new by his grace and love and power. And so we have to, yes, somebody should clap right there, that's yeah. right. And so we, we, we dare not become afraid of this because it just seems like it's in our peer groups and it's in society and the devil's working and all that. Listen, let his name be lifted higher forever. Amen. Our hope is in Jesus. Amen. And such were some of you. Yes. But you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified by Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, um, moving on here, um, we, we've again just hit on this briefly, but just to unpack it a little more, uh, sexual molestation can powerfully affect the sexual identification and orientation of a person. And so, yeah. l let's go there for just a little bit. Well, say you're a young girl and you're being sexually abused by a male. You're going to be afraid of males, aren't you? That's going to begin to instill fear of males in you. And if it goes on long enough, and if it's brutal enough, hatred of males. So, so you can see how the feeling a girl might have of the opposite sex can be dramatically altered by sexual abuse. And again, affected by some of those other contributing factors, temperament, sensitivity levels, outside influence, and so forth and so on. So for the, for, and this is more common among lesbians. Uh, in fact, lesbians as a, as a whole, they don't all say this, but the majority of say this, that they ch chose to be homosexual. Now, the male homosexuals don't like them saying that, but the female homosexual leaders, like Camille Pagli and others, uh, insist that, that they chose to be homosexual. And, the, and my contention is the reason they chose to be homosexual in their behaviors is because of the hurt that they've gotten from men. They can't trust men anymore. It's too risky for them. And they would just rather go with women, the safe, comfortable choice. With boys, a boy who's sexually abused by a woman, that can significantly mess a boy up. Um, 
it's laughed about on Jay Leno as something lucky to have happen to you, but it's, it's not lucky to have happen to you. It's a major sin against you. Um, and it can really mess you up, particularly if it's your mother. Imagine the identity confusion that would happen if your mother is sexually molesting you as a boy. The fear you would have of women immediately and the pressure you would feel by their very presence because after all, it's your mother. Um, or some significant lady in, in my family environment. This is a good example of a contributing factor. We had a lady in our family that looked like Marilyn Monroe. This is back in the 50s and 60s when she was the big movie star, biggest star in the world. And this woman who looked like her would tease me about girls incessantly when I was five, six, seven, eight years old. And that caused me to fear sexually mature women. She looked like Marilyn Monroe. She was the icon of sexuality, mm -hmm. but she was humiliating me. And so I grew up with this fear, this underlying fear of women that God showed me later in my healing process. Otherwise, today I would not have even been able to spot that one. The Lord actually pointed that one out to me. So there's all kinds of unpredictable factors that can also come into play like that. And so a boy who's being molested by a woman can, be, can affect his uh, confidence with women, but a boy who's being molested by a man adds another level of, why did he do this to me? Am I gay? Did he see something gay in me? Am I now ruined? Uh, why did I have pleasure when it happened? You're always gonna have pleasure when you're having sexual experience, no matter what it is. So why did I have the pleasure? That must mean I am gay. And all of these lies just fill your mind and begin to form your identity. Now, friends, this is where I wanna uh, talk to you um, because I think this really has the ability to, to shape not just your personal life, but to shape Grace Chapel as we go into the future. When we hear these things about the effects of physical and sexual abuse on, on precious, innocent little kids, that has to cause, it has to cause major compassion in our hearts. It has to. Like if that doesn't, I, I don't know what's ever going to make you feel any compassion for anybody. When you think about little boys and little girls at very young ages being physically or sexually abused, they didn't sign up for it, they didn't volunteer for it, they didn't want it to happen, they didn't ask it to happen, and this tragedy came upon them. Can we just agree like that that's not the fault of a precious little boy or girl? Like that's not their fault. And now these other contributing factors happen and now we've got someone who's 30 years old. And based on all of these contributing things, they find themselves as an adult living a homosexual life. And the church, because we don't understand a lot of this, and we just pick some verse out that says that it's an abomination and they should stop it. The, the church isn't a place of healing for them, it's a place of condemnation. And so what we need to allow God to shape into our hearts is massive amounts of education and understanding coupled with huge compassion. They didn't ask for this to happen. And so I just, that's just, that's the pastor part of my heart that just says, God, could you do that in, in all of our lives here at Grace Chapel? <laughs> and, and could people stay and let you do that in their hearts instead of leaving and being offended that I'm saying that we need to show the grace and kindness of God to every type of broken person in the world. Let's not pick and choose. All right, so we've talked about enough of the things that are, that are heartbreaking and disturbing and sad. Like we need to get to some good news here pretty quick. Amen. And so um, I, I wanna talk for the next little bit here about healing homosexual confusion and kind of getting the ball rolling on, on how does someone start their healing journey. Now I also wanna again parenthetically say 
that what we're about to talk about for the next several minutes isn't just for sexual brokenness. It's like whatever your struggle is. You're pounding too many Twinkies, this will work for you. (laughs) You you can't put down the Diet Cokes like this will work for you, okay? Mm -hmm. These are spiritual principles that, that when we avail ourselves to God fully, which is what he asks, then real life change happens. So, healing homosexual confusion. What should a person with homosexual attractions do to get their healing process started? Well, like any other uh, sinful lifestyle, it's confession and repentance is where you must start because that's where God comes in and changes you, makes you a new creation and comes in with power to enable you to resist things you had no power to resist prior to that. So confession and repentance is absolutely critical. There's a gay Christian movement out there that's saying, no, you don't have to repent. Uh, You can keep on uh, practicing homosexuality and still be a Christian. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches we must come to the cross and lose our lives in order to gain it. We must give up whatever God calls unholy. And so we need to confess that it is sin and repent of it, say that we're sorry for com- committing it, and in some cases even renounce. I mean, God pointed out to me on many occasions over one sin or another, I want you to renounce that thing. I want you to speak against it aggressively yeah. and, and cut it off from your life as ever again being an option in your life. Yeah, this is so important, David. W- words like confession and repentance and renouncing, these are, these are words of action. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're aggressive words. They're, they're things that we have to get serious about. Like you can't, you can't just kind of mamby-pamby your way through your Christian experience expecting any transformation in any area of your life, especially areas of profound strongholds. And so our, our answer to people who are struggling with anything isn't, we'll give Jesus a shot or give Jesus 20% of your life and roll the dice and see what happens. No, what God has told all of us is, if you'll seek me with all, would y'all say all? (laughs) All. If you'll seek me with all your heart, then you'll find me. And so our message is this, if you want to be free from whatever it is that has you bound, it's going to require you getting active and aggressive and going after the one who can heal you. Well, that's going to take too much effort. Well, the results of that effort are much more beneficial than the results of the lack of effort, I assure you. And so I I want to be clear, we're talking about an all-in commitment to Jesus here that will change your life forever. We have to say that. I I don't want to preach a watered-down gospel that just says that, you know, just kind of do it halfway and it'll be all right. I'm free today. I'm, I'm free from doing drugs and getting loaded and chasing women. I'm free from that. Why? Not because I went to church every once in a while, but because at 18, 19 years old, I made a committed decision to say, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. Mm. And if you're Lord, I'm going to do as much as I can with the power that you give me to obey you and to walk this out. Mm. I'm not going to play games. I'm not going to pretend Christian. Now, it hasn't made me perfect, but it has got me way further down the road from where I started. You can't play. You got to be all in. And you'll find out when you're all in that there's nothing better than that. Mm -hmm. And that's what keeps you free. Once you come to this, uh, once you come to Christ, it's very likely you've been committing idolatry, as I described, where you're idolizing your lovers. Uh, they represent something to you that you feel you're lacking, and this is why you're trying to bond with them sexually. Um, so idolatry must be renounced and repented of. Rebellion, which is as the sin of witchcraft, according to 1 Samuel 15, 23, rebellion must be. Uh, confessed and repented of. Um, Unforgiveness is a biggie. Mm -hmm. All the people who've hurt you, God's going to take you through that list. Now, he didn't take me through all all of my list because I had thousands 
of people that I had something against. He just brought the real biggies up with me. Uh, and he said, basically said to me, if, you, if we go through the shorter list, I'll do the rest for you, you know. But um, he brought up the guy who bullied me when I was a kid. He, <clears throat> he brought up the people who sexually molested me. He brought up my father at the very end, uh, who I could not forgive. I hated my father with a passion. He was the man I most hated on this planet. Mm. But, be, but after God had gotten through with me, he became the man I most loved on this planet. Praise the Lord. Yes. <clears throat> and there was one incident in particular where God said, today, I want you to forgive your father, David. And I said, Lord, you know I'll say the words because you're asking me to, but you also know I won't mean it. And the Lord said, look up at me. What do I have? And I saw a vision of the Lord in heaven, and he had forgiveness in his hand. And he said, I can forgive your father. Take it from me and give it to your father. Hmm. And I thought, well, I can do that. So I reached up in a spiritual sense and took forgiveness from Jesus and handed it to my father. And I could feel the forgiveness coursing from the heart of Christ hmm. through my heart and out into my father. I literally had a supernatural enablement to forgive what I could not forgive. And many of you have been sexually abused. That's, that's the way, that's a similar way that it may happen with you, where you have to get God's enablement to do it in order to do it fully. And Again, in all this, there is a very real spiritual component, yes. both good and bad, that, that is at work here. And we have to access the good in yeah. order to be healed. Yeah. I love that. Um, Self-pity is, is often present in somebody who's been through a great deal of brokenness. God will call you to address that at a certain point because it is unhealthy on many levels. So confession and repentance of sinful behavior, uh, idolatry, rebellion, unforgiveness, self-pity. Yes. All, all four of those things, just radically important parts of this that we have to confess and, and repent of if we're struggling in these areas. Yeah, and often uh, somebody coming out of homosexual thinks, well, it's not fair, you know, I didn't ask for this, and, and it's just not fair. God's going to understand if I go ahead and do this. And uh, look, Lots of people have trials in their life. At least you weren't born without arms and legs. You weren't born with a lot of other conditions that are even more difficult. So, so you're not being singled out by God for some hard task. In fact, what God wants to do is to turn your hard task into his glory and, and into great fruit for the kingdom of God. Yeah. Um, and you will thank him for all of eternity for what you went through because it gave you a chance to give him glory in the end. Yeah. Uh, so how do you engage the Holy Spirit in the healing process? How, how, do, how do we actively, we're talking about getting aggressive now, how do we go about that? What does that look like? <clears throat> well, you have to practice the presence of God. Mm. I love this line from Ann Ortland. She said, it is the look to Jesus that saves, but it is the gaze upon Jesus that sanctifies. That's it is great. when we enter into this intimacy with him where he becomes our father, mm -hmm. the perfect father maybe we never had. And he begins to affirm us, and he begins to impart the missing pieces, and he begins to heal the damaged soul. That's when things really begin to turn around and the joy starts to come. And so, and it's the answer for everything really. It's the purpose Absolutely. of life is to develop an intimate relationship with God the Father, yes. and then just do what he tells you, that's it. That's the whole of life. Yeah. And it is a joyous life. It's, it's, I would never go back yeah. to anything that I once did to lose that. Uh, calling upon the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver us. Again, not just for sexual brokenness, but for all things that any of us struggle with. It's, it's not by might nor by power, but by God's Spirit. It's not us, pull, well, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, I ain't even got any bootstraps. <laughs> Like, I need, the, I need the Holy Spirit to come and, and empower me with that, with that dunamis, that dynamite spiritual power to be a witness for Jesus and to live a transformed life. Christianity is not about, this is what I'm going to do. It's about saying, God, I can't do it. Now you give me the power to do this, and here I go. Yeah. I'm grateful that Jesus said in Luke 11:13, 13, right? The Father will give you the Holy Spirit if you ask him. Right. And ask, again, is an aggressive word. It's to beg and to crave. 
to desire above all things. When God sees a heart like that, he goes, hey, let me hook you up. And it means to believe it. Yeah. Jesus said he would give the Holy Spirit. You need to believe that when you're asking him. I'll, I'll never forget one night I was uh, committing a relatively minor sin compared to all the rest. <laughs> and I was... Uh, <laughs> Just go ahead and tell us what that was, David. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I was complaining to the Lord, Lord, you set me free from lots bigger stuff than this. How come you're not setting me free from this? And he said, it's because you love it. Mm -hmm. That was a great revelation because, yeah, of course, it wouldn't attract me if there wasn't some part of my heart that still loved it. And so I knew what my marching orders were from that point on on that sin. It was to ask the Lord to give me a greater love for him than that sin and therefore to empower the deliverance from it. Yeah. Galatians 5.16, in talking about the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul says if we walk by the Holy Spirit, we're not going to carry out the desire of the flesh. That's right. And so it, it's, not a, it's not as much about not doing these bad things as it, as it is just fully giving yourself to the person and work of the Holy Spirit. That's the real issue because when you do that, then you're not going to do this other stuff. Yeah, and not going off on your own self-righteous attempt to fix yourself, but waiting on God to release the power over whatever's tempting you. It says very clearly in is it 2 Peter 1, 3, that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Right. So it's already resident within you. The power over sin by virtue of the presence of Christ within you is already resident. It just needs to be released by your desire for it to be released right. and your faith that God loves you enough and has the power to overcome what you're up against. It is about appropriating your identity that is in Jesus Christ that gives you power over it all. It is about identity and the power of God over and over and over again. First Corinthians 10, 13 says, when you are tempted, God will provide the way out so that you can stand up under it. Mm. You either believe that or you don't. If you believe yeah. it with all your heart, He'll do it. Yeah. David, let's quickly talk about the, the, the issue of renewing our mind because, as you said, you know, we get filled with thoughts from outside and society and peer pressure, and the devil will lie to us big time. So the importance of renewing our mind in overcoming our struggles, again, regardless of what your struggle is, you got to have your mind renewed. Yeah. The Bible says, clothe yourself with Christ. Yeah. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means getting into the Word on a regular basis and letting it renew your thinking. Getting into God's presence and listening for His voice, telling you what's true as opposed to what you feel or think. Because yeah. feelings lie to you all the time. Let me tell you a story. I was, I was speaking once, and this lady abruptly stood up and marched out of the room. And I was speaking on child <laughs> That happens to me all <laughs> the time. <laughs> and I was speaking on child abuse, so I thought... Oh no, I've just, I've just set her off into memories of her own child abuse and now she's going out to kill herself. And all of these thoughts started flooding my mind of the big mistake I just, just made. And uh, even though I kept teaching. And, uh, and then she came, five minutes later, she comes back and sits down. Well, truth was, she had gone to the bathroom. <laughs> but what had happened to me? I believed my thoughts and my feelings, which were lying to me. Right. I just didn't even think to challenge them. I just believed them. And we do this. We believe our thoughts and our feelings without even thinking about it. We need to test them according to the Word of God. Yeah, when we, we did the series last year on winning the mind wars, um, you know, that was received so well and people understood the fact that, you know what, I, I can't choose the thoughts that my mind has, but I can choose what I do with them which is the issue here. I've got to learn 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, where I'm taking those thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. And so either my own flesh conjures up some sinful thing or the devil downloads some sinful thing into my mind. What am I going to do? I'm, I'm going to put it through the filter of what's God's way, what's God's word, what's God's will. And if it comes out where it's not in line with God's word, way, or will, I'm taking that thing captive and saying, that's not the, the will of God in Christ Jesus for my life. Again, I, being aggressive. Yeah, and I renounce it. No, I renounce Jesus. it in the name I of Jesus. I renounce it as the lie that it is. Yeah, absolutely. What about guarding your heart? Well, you guard your heart by, again, by regularly being in intimate communion with God, 
regularly feeding on his word, regularly being in the body of Christ, actively involved in the body of Christ, surrounding yourselves, yourself with other like-minded pe minded people, people who are also going after God with all of their heart. Yeah. And that needs to happen whether you're sexually broken or not. Mm -hmm. that we're, we're called to do that with each other, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but uh, as the day gets closer, exhorting and encouraging one another mm -hmm. even more. Yeah. So that's not unique to just overcoming sexual brokenness. We're all called to be in on that level. Yeah, the Bible says to put on the new self. Yeah. That's something it's, God is telling you to do. Put on the new self, created to be like Jesus, and set your heart against the evil, against the world. Yeah. Set your heart against it. Um, what does God actually do to heal the brokenness? Like, how, what, how does God do his part of this? Well, as I've already mentioned, he, he replaces what was lost. If you get into that intimate place with him, he will begin to replace what was lost. He will speak into you your goodness as a male or a female or, or whatever you need. He'll begin to um, just transform your thinking. And just, just being with him, the, sometimes he'll let you feel his presence, the love that he has for you. Sometimes you'll just feel it in the room. That is massively healing. One two-second feeling of the love of God can heal, you know, 10 years of some kind of bondage. You know, one of my big pet fees as a child was my father never played ball with me, and I was a big baseball fan, and uh, he never threw, threw the ball with me. So, 15 years later, I'm in my healing process, just minding my own business, singing love songs to God, and suddenly I get this vision, and God the Father is throwing. Throwing the ball to me. Who'd have thought? Um, that's something you don't make up on your own. You don't expect that God knows you that well and loves you that deeply. Yeah. But that's the kind of thing he can surprise you with when you get into his presence as a lifestyle. He's that personal. Yeah. Of course, God's a baseball fan, too. Exactly. Yeah. And he loves the Yankees. All right. Hey, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the big inning. I'm just saying. <laughs> all right, all right. Something else beautiful that God does is God transfers his wholeness into you. Mm. He, he, he doesn't just replace what you lost, but he actually transfers his own wholeness into you. Yeah. He doesn't just patch you up and make a better old you. You actually become a brand new creation in Jesus Christ. Yes, and he returns your innocence to you. I don't want to describe to you how jaded and fallen and sexually broken I was, but I was very perverse when I got saved. I never could believe that I would be innocent again, but God actually over the years returned my innocence to me. Uh, I now blush at jokes that I would not have thought anything about before. And when I discovered that I had that innocence once again, I just rejoiced in my spirit at the at the degree that God will go to transform you into his image if you pursue him for it. All right, some practical points to recovery. Um, God's part is to supply the power and the authority. Ours is to take those tools and use them to put to death the old nature with its struggles. Next, allow God to identify for you roots of spiritual, mental, and emotional disease. Next, ask God for the power over these strongholds, and he'll give it. Next, starve the old nature to death. I love that. Avoid the people, places, and things that God reveals as feeding troughs for your sin nature. I, I think it's as simple as this, friends. It gets to the point where Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He didn't say, you know, talk with it for a while. It's decisive, it's, it's, it's going after it, it's starving it, it's cutting things off. Next, learn to recognize the schemes of the devil by seeking the Lord to reveal them to you. We've talked about that. Take the kingdom of God by force. We've talked about that. It, it takes an all-in attitude. Uh, don't rush ahead of what the Lord is doing in some misguided effort to please him or to earn your keep. Yeah. I made that mistake. Yeah. I tried to prove myself to God in order to retain the love I had now gotten from him 
and it was a big mistake. I didn't need to retain it. It was there forever. Amen. And I didn't need to run ahead of him in my healing process using my wisdom. I needed to wait for his wisdom and his timing. What advice would you give a parent that could help them minimize the chances for homosexual confusion that might try to develop in their own children? Long list, but if you could just yeah. crank through. Protect your child, but don't exasperate. Don't smother them in protection, but do protect them. Do gender identify things with them. If your son likes to play baseball, throw the ball with him. Uh, or whatever the child is liking to do. Whatever speaks to the child that they're one with you. In that your, affirms their gender. That affirms their gender. Yeah. Uh, do uh, give non-sexual physical love and affection to them. Hug your son. Do not be afraid that you're going to make him into a homosexual. That's ridiculous. Hug your son and affirm him and love him and, and tell him when he's done well. And do the same with your daughters. The, by the way, the father it calls both son and daughter into their sexual identity. It is a unique thing that the father does. So this is important. Take time to reaffirm their masculinity or their femininity. When you see them doing, uh, performing as a male or a female uniquely well, let them know you're proud of them. That you're, you have joy in them over that. I, I think Tim Taylor from Tool Time was very successful at that with the three <laughs> little boys. Uh, any of the fathers know what his thing was, right? When the little boys did something right, or, ar, 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 you know, that, that's a biblical principle right there. I'm just telling you. I think I missed out on that. <laughs> you should go back and watch it. I think it would be very healing. I think it would be great. I don't know what you're talking the about. The power of tool story. time. I'm just saying. <laughs> Next. Tool schmoles. I missed out on that one. I'm not getting that one back. Create an atmosphere in your family where your child is free to ask you anything and teach them sexual knowledge at an age-appropriate level, at the level that they express an interest in it, mm -hmm. and to the depth that they request. Don't give them a huge answer to a short question. Uh, and to the extent of their exposure to it in the culture. Now the culture is sexualizing our children far sooner than is healthy developmentally for them. But if the culture's already doing it, you've got to have an answer for them as well on, that, on whatever that issue is. Teach them the biblical model for sex and the standards for sex. Do it with grace and truth. Yeah. Teach them the realities of sexual temptation and the dangers and the ways to respond to them. Do it at an age-appropriate level as they grow up. Tell them your own war stories if, if it's an age-appropriate level. Carefully check out all children and adults who are given charge over them. Yes. Stephen highlighted that quite nicely already. Teach your children that they should not obey authorities who try to engage them in sexual activities and that they should report those who do to you, no matter what threats are made against them. However, teach them not to tell the perpetrator that they're going to report what he or she has done because that might put them in danger, mm -hmm. but to tell you as soon as they can after it's over, as soon as they can get the chance. Um, the last two I just threw in because it was my experience. Uh, don't let your children go to health spas or hitchhike alone. These are great breeding grounds for homosexual seduction. I, and almost every time I ever went to a health spa and almost every time I ever hitchhiked, I was approached homosexually. Mm -hmm especially in the showers. So once I got saved, I still went to the gym, but I just stopped going into the showers. I just went home and showered at home. So if I had young children, that's how I, I might handle that. Have a friend or you go with them and shower at home. Praise and affirm them as often as is appropriate would be my last piece of advice on that. Yeah. So friends, looking over the last two weeks and all of the massive amounts of information, we, we want to get to this third and final point, which is just a couple sentences. How do we, as the Church of Jesus Christ, practically love the homosexual? How do we show them the love of Jesus? It boils down to what we started with. You have to know what the truth is, and you have to speak it in love. Ignorance and silence isn't love. Know the truth. 
You, you can't look at someone again and just say, well, my preacher said it was bad. If you'll study to show yourself approved and be able to articulate um, some of the issues with it, it's going to show that person that you actually care enough to learn about something that really hasn't anything to do with you. So study to show yourself approved. Speak the truth in love. Respect, don't condemn. Remember, be compassionate because a lot of these folks didn't ask for the things to happen to them that did. I think it would be uh, good just to summarize it by saying, be the Christian that they don't think exists. Be the Christian that they don't think exists. but do it with love and compassion. If we'll do that, instead of just shouting at the darkness all the time, we might be able to see the light of Jesus turn on in some people's hearts, and we might from this very platform hear testimonies that would boggle our mind. I'm up for that. Is anybody else? Yeah, me too.